evening, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Simon Brown from Just One Lap, doing this evening's presentation. The, the first point is, the sense is that, that it's working. Uh, and later this month, uh, Finance Minister Gordon will, in his budget speech, probably give us some indication of exactly how well, or well it isn't. A year ago, he spoke about a billion rand invested, about 150,000 people who had opened tax-free accounts, which is not shabby, although, in truth, there are about 7 million South Africans earning above the, the 15,000 threshold. So 150,000 is smallish, but nonetheless, there are numbers there. What's most important is it's doing what it says on the sticker, which is you can invest and you don't have tax liability. And I want to stress that because I get the emails. I had one today. Someone was saying, I've got a, an ETF in my, in my tax-free account. Can I sell it? And if I do sell it, am I liable for tax? You can sell it, and you're not liable for any tax. He's made a profit. He's turned his two deposits. 60,000 is now about 65,000, uh, and he wants to sell those ETFs and buy something else. And that's absolutely fine, as long as it stays within your tax-free account. There are some gremlins. I'll touch on the gremlins in a bit. Quick look at it. So it is literally no tax at all. There's no tax on dividends. How do they know not to? Because the way we have dividend tax these days is dividend withholding tax. So the company pays a one rand dividend, but you get 85 cents because SARS kind of sneaks in and grabs 15 cents as the money is en route to you. And what happens here is it's flagged as a tax for your account. SARS knows not to reach in and grab the money. Because also, if you're a, 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 a collective investment scheme, you're not paying that 15% and the like. So SARS knows that this is a tax-free account. And therefore, SARS knows not to reach in and grab that, that dividend withholding tax. So the dividend comes to you without any tax. If you've got cash in the account and you earn interest, there's no tax on the interest. You don't have to declare that interest in terms of tax liabilities. If you're selling and you've made a profit, on the sale, there's no capital gains tax to be paid. There's no income tax to be paid. And if you took, if you've put 30,000 rand in and you've grown it to 35,000 and you now extract that 35,000 out, there's no tax. It is exactly as it says on the sticker. Although you've made a profit, that profit is not taxable because it was done within a tax-free environment. So it is exactly as it says. It is tax-free in literally every which way it possibly can be. And of course, no security transfer tax, which is at 0.25%. In truth, it's moot because you don't pay that on ETFs, e EFT sorry, anyway. You pay it on shares uh, and you pay it on property and stuff, but you're not paying it on, on an exchange-traded fund, so that's not applicable anyway. But it is exactly as it says. The one exception is state duty. When you die, the, the tax-free portion will be unwound, <coughs> excuse me, it will become part of your estate. Any profits in there are subject to no tax whatsoever, but if your estate is subject, it's then part of your estate, and then there is potentially state duty to pay, depending on whether you, if you're leaving it to your spouse, there's no estate duty, uh, and if it's over a certain amount, there is certainly a liability. But there will be no estate duty and, uh, if, if, if it's your spouse, otherwise it is just, you know, normal part of what your assets are and you pay the relevant tax on those assets within the estate duty. So up to that point there's absolutely no concerns whatsoever. The key point is keep it within your tax-free account. It is individuals only, so no CCs, no PTYs, no trusts, no partnerships. Uh, individuals only, and it can be any individual. You don't even need to be a South African citizen. What you do need to be able to do is FICA. So if you've got parents living in, I don't know, Mongolia, that's very nice and all, but you can't get a tax-free account for your parents because you can't fee to them because they don't have, a re they're not residency in South Africa. If a person is in South Africa, you do not need to be a South African citizen. But if you're living here, you can claim your tax-free account. You can do for children. Uh, the guardian will have to do the FICA documents for the child. A couple of points about it. If you're going to a stockbroker, they cannot, by the rules of the JSC, open an account for a person under the age of seven. If you're going to an FSP, financial service provider, they can open an account for absolutely anybody. And I know to the audience here, you don't you assume that your stockbroker is a stockbroker. In truth, your stockbroker might be an FSP, and you would be unaware of that fact. The way you find out is when you try and open an account for someone under the age of seven, they say, sorry, we can't. Okay, then you just go and find yourself an FSP. 
And if you're struggling to find an FSP, drop me a mail. I'll send you uh, a list of who the FSPs are as opposed to who the stockbrokers are. The child does not need to have ID. The child does not need to have a tax number. The child does not need to have a bank account. All you do is you open it in, the, you open it in their name and the guardian, which is the FICA legislation, the guardian does the FICA documentation. The point being is that when the child wants to draw the money out of the tax-free account, it has to go into a bank account in South Africa in their name. So they don't need it now. But in 20 or 30 years when they want to take the money out, they're going to need a bank account. They don't need it at this point in time. I know some people who've opened bank accounts for their kids in order to open a tax-free account. And you don't need that bank account at this point in the process. Same li limit applies to the children again, uh, and we'll come to that in, in, a, in a second. A last point on opening for kids, and this is a debate. I, I don't have kids, but I have a niece and nephew who will be turning seven and nine this year. Um, and I've been buying them ETS for birthdays and Christmases over the years. I'm not putting this money into a tax-free account for them. And here's why. The trick is, is that they hit... 20 years old, and they want to use the money for education, or a first car, or an apartment, or to get married, or to take a gap year, or whatever the case may be. And that's all the cool things to spend the money on. But if they cash in their tax-free account at the age of 20, they're losing the real advantage of it. Which is, if you can start a tax-free account when you're a kid, and run it to 65, your returns are going to be humongous. Whereas if you cash in after 20 years, yeah, you've got return but you've given up 45 years of potential return. So, I've, 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 so, so I've, I've said to my sister, and it's a debate I'm still having with her, in the sense that if the money I'm putting aside for the kids is going to be used in their 20s, I'm not going to put it in a tax-free account. I would rather they open one of their own accord when they're earning and then run it for the 40 years or so until their retirement. And that's, you know, there are pros and cons, and there are different ways of skinning it. But that certainly is the, 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 the issue. Another step is... If you're doing one to pay for the kid's first year of schooling at age six, you're only going to get six years of advantage, and I don't think that's necessarily long enough either. So I've held back on doing it for the, for the kids in my life, notwithstanding they're not mine directly, but I've held back on it, and, and that's the whys, because otherwise, to my sense, they cash it in far too early. Those limits remain 30,000 per year per individual. So a family of four, Two parents, two kids, you could technically open four tax-free accounts, one per each, and you can put 30,000 per person, 120,000 per year. So 30,000 per person. We got the budget speech later this month. Will Minister Godan change that limit? I don't think so. I think he has other challenges, and I think if he starts increasing the limits on the one hand while he's trying to raise tax on the other hand, it's going to look a little bit messy. So I think the limits will stay in place at this point in time. The truth is that the numbers are telling us that the majority of people are not hitting the 30,000 limit either. So for him, it's probably politically difficult because it's probably more you know, the one percenters rather than the, the vast majority of the South African population to whom the 30,000 is an issue. Profits, growth, do not impact the limit. You put 30,000 in, it grows to 35, that's cool. All that matters is how much you put in. You put in 30,000 Rand. That's what matters. What it becomes is irrelevant. If it falls to 25,000, you can't add another five. The limit is what matters. The 30,000 that goes in is what matters. And the limit is per individual. Don't go open a tax-free account in your name at four different institutions and drop 30,000 into each. Because SARS is going to catch you on your ID number, and they're going to say, nope, the 30,000 is per you. You can open four tax-free accounts with four different institutions, but your 30,000 is across all four, not per each. Uh, the year runs tax year, so March to Feb. So if you haven't hit your 30,000 for this year, you've got until the end of February. Very important. The money needs to reflect in the account in February. So if you do a transfer at 2 o'clock on the last day of February and it reflects on the 1st of March, it's next year's money. It needs to reflect in the account in February. You know when you move money around and it disappears for two days, goes on holiday to Durban or something? Be cognizant of that fact when you're shifting it around. 
And then you've got a lifetime limit. 500,000 is what you can deposit into your tax-free account over your lifetime, capping at 30,000 a year. So if you're doing 30,000 per year, that's just short of 17 years. If you're only doing 20,000 a year, it's going to take you 25 years to hit that 500,000 lifetime limit. I suspect that much as the 30,000 will increase slowly over time, I expect the 500,000 to increase over time. I've also heard talk, although I've been unable to verify it, that what Treasury might do is say, if you're 65 or older, the 30,000 falls away, but the 500 remains in place, i.e., if you're a senior citizen, you can max it out one time. But I've, had no, I, I've heard that from a couple of different sources. I know it's been proposed. I don't expect, again, that to happen anytime soon, but that might, and, and, and to me, it makes sense. Cash deposits only, so you can't transfer into it. If you've got an ETF that you're holding at Satrix and you want to move it into your tax-free account, you have to sell, take the cash, move it across, and then repurchase. And the reason for that is quite simple, because when an ETF is moved in, at what price is it moved in? Now, let's say you take the price at the end of the day, so you very carefully move 768 ETFs, because that's exactly 30,000 Rand, and the market goes up 1%, so when it lands, it's 33,000 Rand and you've exceeded your annual limit. If you exceed the annual limit, they tax that excess at 40%. So if you put in 35,000 Rand in a, in a single tax year, they take that 5,000 Rand and they fine you 40% on the 5,000 Rand. In order to, I suppose, encourage people not to. That limit, I'm going to come back to the limit in a moment, so I'll touch on that in a bit. As I said, I expect those to go up. That's the critical point. That's always the question I'm getting asked. My profits have increased. Have I exceeded my limit? It's the deposit that matters. Nothing else. It's how much cash did you move into it? What can you buy? Exchange-traded funds, ETFs, uh, which are baskets of shares. So you get an ETF on the top 40. They literally buy those 40 shares that make up the top 40 index, put it in a basket, and they sell it to you. We've got about 80 ETFs and ETNs in South Africa. Just over 40 of them are applicable for tax-free accounts, and those are them. So this list has grown over the years. Um, the two most recent issue was late last year, which is the core shares S&P 500 and the core shares global property. Those both came late last year. They are both able to be included into a tax-free account. There are two new Satrix ETFs that are coming later this month. One is on the uh, inflation-linked bond index, and the other is on a property index, and they will also both be applicable into your tax-free account. What I have found with all of the providers that I have checked, and I've looked at a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, is that if you try and buy an ETF that is not applicable within a tax-free account, their system won't allow it. They just don't let you buy it. So if you go and try buy new gold, which is not allowed, the system just says, nope, sorry, no can do, this is not a tax-free product. What we do have is a bunch of offshores. Uh, we've obviously got some properties. We've got equal weighted, which includes a property and the top 40. We've got your JSC indices and sub-indices, such as top 40, SWIX, Indy, Finney, and Resi. Uh, we've got the debt cash instruments as well. Uh, we've got your bespoke. What I mean by bespoke is a little bit different. There's a momentum, there's a Sharia, there's a whole lot of uh, ones coming out of, out of uh, ABSA, which is the Givies, uh, Financial Industrial, the SA and the Resources. The Core Shares one, the Top 50, the Low Voltrax. We've got some dividend ones. We've got the RAFI, which is Research Affiliate Fundamental Indexation. Those are what we call Smart Beta, as is with the bespoke are also Smart Beta. What do you mean by smart? So typically what an ETF is, it just buys the index, whatever that index is. Smart beta says, let's apply some rules before we determine either what to buy or perhaps the weightings to buy. So they will use, for example, in their top 50 or in the low vol volatility, they will say, okay, let's exclude the 30% the, the 30 of most volatile stocks. 
and then use that pool of what's left and then put a liquidity filter on and use what's left. So they try and get smart about which ones go in. I'm going to be perfectly honest. I'm not convinced by smart beta. It sounds great, and the back testing looks great, but they're doing five or seven years of back testing, and I plan to hold this thing for 20 or 30 or 40 years, and in the, you know, five, seven years is not a heck of a lot. And I can't help wondering if at some point in five or 10 years' time, there's going to be a smart beta meltdown, which is a sense of, well, you know what, we were thought we were smart, but it turned out the smart wasn't so smart. And I have one example, and, and maybe I'm being crazy. Maybe I'm absolutely crazy, in which case I will accept that. But I have one example, and that is Satrix Divi, which is the first smart beta we ever had in South Africa. It launched around 2008, if memory serves correct, and it was an absolute disaster of, of, a, of an ETF because its methodology was broken. So its methodology was it looked at stocks with a high forward dividend yield, and bought the 30 stocks out of the 100 that had the highest forward dividend yield. The problem is, and there are two examples we've had in recent times, Kumba and African Bank. They had both been high dividend payers. And then the share price collapsed, so the dividend yields were high already. Then the share price collapsed, so the dividend yield went even higher. And then the dividend got cancelled and went to zero. And you were sitting with three of the worst performing shares over the last five years, PPC, African Bank, and Kumba, were sitting in your div tracks because of the methodology. And, you know, I, and, and that's what my concern is. These smart beaters work great, but what happens if something happens and the wheels fall off? You know, and we could, I mean, we can make an argument for all three of those shares and say, ah, but we could see it coming. I mean, maybe, but in truth, if you held Satrix Divi, you held all three of those stocks as they were plummeting to earth. And the best, I mean, with Kumba, yes, I know it's gone from 25 Rand to 200. Yeah, you didn't get that benefit because they sold it, they, they exited out at about 105. African Bank, I don't know where they exited. They might actually have been holding when it went bust. I'm not sure. Actually, I, I actually haven't checked up on that. But the point being is that's my concern around Smart Beta. Then you've got the balance from uh, ABSA, which is just trying to do everything in one. So you've got the growth and the protect. What they're basically saying is, cool, we put some equity, we put some cash, put some property, put some bonds, try and give you a nice balanced one. The one is protect, which is low growth, low volatility, and one is growth, which is trying to aim to give you growth. So it's kind of like a retirement annuity. It is not Reg 28 compliant. Regulation 28 of the Retirement Act is high, the, the weightings you have to have. It's not Reg 28 compliant, but it's kind of trying to do that balanced portfolio in one ETF. If you want more information, go to justonelap.com slash ETFs. We have reviewed many of them, not necessarily all of them, but probably the majority of them if you want more delving into them, or just hit Google as your friend. I'm going to delve into some of them in more detail as individually. What can't you put in? Exchange traded notes. So what's an ETF? What's an, an ETN? An ETF, exchange traded fund. The company that's managing it, be it Core Shares, be it Satrix, be it Deutsche Bank, ABSA, uh, who else have we got? Um, I'm forgetting someone and I can't remember who. RMB and all the others, who we love anyway, even if we can't remember their name. They physically buy those shares, and they physically put those shares in a special purpose vehicle so that if the business who's managing it goes bust, no worries, your shares are there. So all the concerns around Deutsche Bank last year and all those Deutsche Bank ETFs, no worries. Because if Deutsche Bank goes bust, it will be messy, but you're safe. <clears throat> an ETN is an exchange-traded note. That is essentially a credit note. It's a promise to pay the return. So there you do have a level of risk. Now the point is, I can't find globally an example of an exchange traded note or exchange traded fund issuer going bust. So we don't have an historical precedent for what happens. And hopefully we never do, but never say never. So there is a, to my mind, there is a slightly higher risk in the ETN. I don't think that risk is necessarily marked. I know there was concerns around Deutsche Bank last year. In truth, if Deutsche Bank goes down, your problems are not your ETN. 
Your problem is a global worldwide banking crisis that will make 2008 look like a walk in the park. You've got bigger problems than some ETN. There's practical reasons why they do ETNs rather than ETFs, and I give you an example, silver. So there's a silver ETN. It's physically not possible to store silver because silver's, you know, what, $10 an ounce. So if you want to have, you know, $1,000, you just need too much space. Ditto with oil. Oil degrades over time, and oil takes space. So they do an ETN. In other words, they're promising to give you the return, and they then do hedging in the background to mimic that return to you. They cannot be included in an exchange traded in a tax-free account. You cannot even have commodity ETFs. And I think the reason there is, so we've got silver uh, and platinum and gold and palladium, I think palladium, ETFs in South Africa. They cannot be included into your uh, tax-free account. And I think here's the reason. Everything that you can put in your tax-free account is a basket. In other words, if one of the constituents of that basket goes bust, nasty, but not the end of the world. Whereas a commodity ETF, I mean, a commodity is not going bust, but if gold goes to $10 an ounce, and you've got all of your tax-free money in a gold ETF, your tax-free portfolio just got obliterated. So I think Treasury is trying to force us to do baskets because baskets is diversification, and that reduces the risk within your tax-free account. No individual shares, no REITs, uh, real estate investment trusts, and of course, no derivatives either. The big question is withdrawals. You can, at any point, take your money out. You can sell what you have within your, your, your tax-free account, and you can take the money, withdraw it, and go and spend it. The point is, is that when you put money into a tax-free account, you really need to put money in with a multi-decade view. The reality is, life sometimes throws you a curveball. You had a multi-decade view, something happened, and now your multi-decade view has become tomorrow. Okay, so you can get the money out. It's not going to be tomorrow because there's a process. You would have to sell. We have something called T plus 3 in the JSC. So if you sold shares tomorrow being a Friday, the money will only hit your account in three days' time. And then, of course, you've got to transfer it, and the money disappears for a couple of days before it gets into your account. So it might be five days before you practically get it. So you can withdraw. But understand the risk of the withdrawal. The risk of the withdrawal is that reduces your lifetime limit. So remember, you've got the annual limit, and you've got the lifetime limit. So your lifetime limit is, is 500,000. You deposit 30,000 in this tax year. Your lifetime limit now drops to 470,000 because you've already deposited 30. If you take that 30,000 out, your lifetime limit remains 470,000. So money you take out, you can't put back in. That's why I say, try and put the money in there and try and leave it for as many decades as we possibly can. If an emergency happens and we need the cash, we can get it. But the ideal is put it in and leave it for as many decades as we can afford to give it. That is ultimately the plan on it. You also can't, you, so I mean, in, in theory, you can take your profits out if you want it. So your 30,000 grows to 35. Yeah, I mean, you could take out the five if you wanted and just leave the 30 behind. The point is that you're hindering your return because that five is going to grow and the growth of that 5,000 will be tax-free as well. So, yeah, you can, but no, don't. Transfers, I'll come to in a second. Transfers are not a withdrawal, but transfers are moot because you can't do them at the moment, so that doesn't matter. So what we have seen in the two years since the tax-free accounts opened is pretty much every provider has got them. Every financial institution has their version of tax-free accounts, which is a good thing, but it's also perhaps a, a bad thing. I mean, if you go to the best bank in the world, Capitec, right? You all realize that? Yes, shareholder. I am an unbiased, I am a totally biased shareholder in that point. If you go to Capitec and you open a tax-free account with Capitec, they basically give you cash. You basically got cash at an interest rate. Nice, but not terribly exciting. You know, cash is great if you want the money in a hurry. Cash is not great if you want the money in 30 years' time. 
Um, but Capitec's not the only. Some of the less great banks in South Africa, if you walk into the branch, will, when you open a tax-free account, will basically give you a call a money market account. And you are, uh, you are, what's the polite way to say screwed? I don't think there is. You just, you just got shafted. You, you got totally, absolutely shafted. Um, so dig around. For me, it's quite simple. I want a pure DIY. What do I mean by that? I want the entire list of options available to me, and I will pick what I want and when I want. And then I'm a crafty oak. I want the lowest cost in terms of transaction fees, and I want the lowest cost in terms of admin fees. <clears throat> and I'm not going to stand up here and name names because then someone will get upset, but I can tell you that the lowest cost to, 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 to buy ETFs in a tax-free account is 0.2% and zero admin fee. 0.2% transaction fee, zero admin fee. If you're paying more than that, Google around, because you're not at the lowest place that there is right now. Um, what we have seen is discount brokerage. Most places have discounted the brokerage. The trend seems to be that they're charging 0.25%, seems to be the trend where they've all kind of settled that apparently no collusion, they all just somehow got to that same 0.25%. Uh, we do get a discount straight fee. We are seeing some fairly low admin fees, and we are seeing some zero admin fees. But we're also seeing some admin fees at as much as 1% per year. Now, 1% in your first year on 30,000 Rand is 300 bucks, and you think to yourself, yeah, it's just a good bottle of wine, or half a dozen so-so bottles of wine. And in my world, I'll take the half dozen bottles of wine. I am not a wine snob. As long as it's red, I'll drink it. Unless you want to buy me wine, in which case, go, go big. 1% <laughs> is fine in year one when it's 30,000. Look, it's not because, you know, we understand compound interest, right? The power of compounding interest on interest. Fees are the exact inverse. They are compounded out of your future. So 1% is small now, but roll forward. 25 years when your fund is now worth 11 and a half million rand. 1% is now suddenly 100,000 bucks and change. Man, that buys you a wine farm. A loss-making wine farm, because they all lose money, but a wine farm nonetheless. So very careful of that fee. I mean, I think, to me, it's quite simple. Charging a fee that is a percentage of your investment should be a crime. If I was doing Sono this evening, I would stand up there and say, you are not allowed to charge a management fee that is a percentage of assets under management. Think about it. When you go to the dentist and he causes a whole lot of pain to you, note, a dentist, one of my life, are always men. I've never met a female dentist. You go to the dentist and they cause you a whole lot of pain. When he comes to invoice you, he doesn't say, so how much are you worth? And the richer you are, the more he charges you. He says, look, for this much pain, this is how much I charge. There's a relationship that goes here. This is the only industry in the world that says, oh, you got money. I'm going to charge you lots. The theory being is they spend more time managing your money. Okay, I hear you, but then charge me by the hour. Don't charge me a percentage of all. Now, in the defense of the industry, the fee situation has been improving and that the fee rates are coming down. Absolutely. And the fact that you can buy a product at 0.2% upfront cost and zero admin is insane. When I bought a unit trust in the 90s, I was paying 6% and there were no performance fees because it never performed. 6% was management fee, advisor fee, platform fee, and ripple fee. So they're much, much better. But to me, it's quite simple. I want flat rates. Will we get there in my lifetime? Maybe. I hope so. We'll see. So some returns. These were done from standard online share trading a year ago. When I presented this number last year, I got into a ton of flack about the 15% because 15 is too high and future returns are only going to be 11. Ish, 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 ish. Okay, so the data which this is taken from is a period from 1987 
to 2006. So it includes that nice bull run, but let's be honest, it included the crash of 1987, it included the emerging market crisis of 1998, and it included the dot-com bust of 2001 that then followed, and a lot of other issues along the way. And for that period, it was 15%. 15% return, 2% dividends, brokerage of quarter percent, zero admin fee, two and a half thousand a month until lifetime limit is hit, which is 16 years and eight months. If we're happy with that, after 24 years, it's worth 11.4 million rand. Sorry, after 25 years, worth 11.4 million rand. Of which, if you're paying 1% a year, you're paying 114,000 rand plus VAT, because hey, why not? Of that 11.4 million, <coughs> half a million is your contribution, 8.8 .8 million is the growth, and 2.1 million is your tax-free benefit. Quite chunky. The key secret, more than the 15% or anything else, 25 years. That's a long time for anybody. Over Christmas, I was trying to explain two years to my nephew. He's eight and a half at the moment, and I'm trying to exp uh, and he can't comprehend when he's 10. It's like <laughs> 10. It's like, no, oh, no, that's just too far away. So 25 years is a long, long time. We're two years in, so we've got 23 more to go. In truth, in an ideal situation, and it's probably not for many of us, because this has come, I don't want to say late in our life, but it hasn't come at the beginning. But if you could start this as a first paycheck, you're a 25-year-old, and you get your first paycheck, and you start hitting your tax-free account, you can run this until you're 65. That is 40 years. Let me quickly do the numbers. 15% we're doubling every five years, so we've got another 20 years. So we go 22, we go 40, we get to about 80 million after 40 years. Now, if I run it backwards to get the inflation over 40 years, 80 million in today's money, I come out at about four and a half million in today's money. Now, I'm doing this math in my head, so it's not exactly. But four or five million in today's money, I mean, it might not be enough to retire on. Although, as I say that, I'm, you know, it's, it's, it depends what quality of wine. Hey, if you're like me, four and a half million is a lot of wine. A lot. So it's real. But as always, what's the key secret here? Yes, the tax-free component is brilliant. But it works because of the time. And as I said, for us, I mean, there are some people here, I can see some youngsters here who are in their 20s. For those of us who are, who are in their 30s and, and, and other such bigger numbers, we've maybe got a little less time. But we can also run it. I mean, technically, I, I will have 20 years from when I started my tax free till I hit 65. But I don't need to cash it at 65. I could maybe push it to 70, 75. I, I plan to live to 131, so I could cash it when I'm 100. So here's the, that, that's all the good news. Here's the bad news. We have not seen 15% returns per year. In fact, we have seen fairly bad years. In fact, if you're like Christia, my colleague, who bought her first ETF three years ago, she managed to do nothing in three years. Flat is the new sexy, people. <laughs> the problem is people phoned me and they said, look, three years ago you told me to buy an ETF, and I did. And three years ago my granny went and bought a bond, the most boring thing in the world. Or she put money in the bank, even more boring, and she's done better than me. Yeah. You know what? Investing parlance, three years is not even warming up. If you come to me and you say, I want to save money for three years, what should I do? I will say, do not put it in the stock market. To my mind, stock market is minimum five-year investment horizon. The truth is, you've been going two years, and I've only got those three ETFs because they're the ones that I've been recommending every time I stand up here, and they've done poorly. Although, over, well, no, they've done badly if you take it for two years. It has not been a great two years to be invested in our market. If you look at our top 40 market, what has it done for now? In fact, come May, as it may come May, for three years, we've pretty much gone sideways. We've been bouncing but pretty much our market has gone sideways. It's done nothing. There are two ways markets correct in price. Well, markets correct. One is in price 2008, when a market crashes off a cliff, everyone panics, and then everything's fine again. The other is it corrects in time, where it goes sideways.
for a couple of years. What happens in the correcting in time? Price goes sideways, but earnings increase, valuations go down. So I was chatting with Jean-Pierre Fustier yesterday and asking him exactly this question. And I said to him, you know, are we starting to see value in our market? And the answer is, in places, yes. Retail stocks. Three years ago, retail stocks, P.E. ratios were 28, 30, 35. Now they're 15, 16, 17. That's, that's value for, for retail stocks. Look, you know, I, I'm, I'm a cheapskate. I'd like them cheaper. But the point is, we've seen that value return. So what we've had is a, is a, is a, is a, is a correction in time rather than price. I prefer the price. Bit of panic, some headlines. Pick up all these shares at 8 bucks a pop, which I didn't do but you could have if you had a time machine. So the returns have been blare. I think I had a look at my, my TFSA, my tax-free account. I've put 60,000 in, and I think it's 64,000. So in two years, I'm up 7.5%, which is, I mean, inflation is, I mean, Capitec bank account is beating me. Heck, a bad bank account is beating me. But that's fine. It's two years. It's short term. I plan to hold this until I'm 100. Don't hold me to that. And then a quick look at some of the comparing ETFs, because the lands and the landscape will keep on changing. There will always be new ETFs coming. The point being is that I have my favorite ETFs. We'll come to those in a second. Well, there they are right there. The point being is that new ones will pop along, and then everyone's like, we're all excited. Oh, new ETF, should we be buying it? Nah, you know, just because it's the new ETF on the block, no, unless there's a compelling reason. So, for example, the new property one offshore, I bought it because we didn't have that before. That was completely new and unique. You give me a new top 40 ETF, it's like, I've already got three top 40 ETFs. What makes yours different? I mean, is it cheaper? Does it come with lollipops? I mean, is there some reason why it's special? So, looking at the offshore, we've got the DBX US, which has been around forever and a day. It tracks the MSCI US 600, which is pretty much an S&P 500. Those extra 100 stocks are like 3% of the ETF. So, it's pretty much an S&P 500. The direct competitor to that is the core shares S&P 500, which was launched uh, last year in October, which tracks the S&P 500. But the key difference is it is cheaper in terms of total expense ratio. It's about 0.3% cheaper per year. 0.3 is not a lot in any one given year, but roll that forward 20, 30, 40 years, and it's going to buy you a couple of bottles of wine. And then you've got the DBX world, which has always been my preferred offshore. The reason I like DBX World is because, yes, it gives me U.S. exposure, currently 58% of U.S. It then gives me Europe, 12%. Uh, it gives me U.K. and Japan, 8% each, and then some other developed markets, which I assume is Canada and I don't know who else. Um, and my preference to it is, is that it gives me that more global exposure. The argument against it is that, you know what the S&P 500 does? These are global companies. You don't get into the S&P 500 by never leaving Texas. You get into the S&P 500 by being a global company, by being Microsoft, General Motors, Apple, Alphabet, and so the list goes on. So what I did was I went and compared the world to the S&P 500. And I thought, you know what, these 500 stocks in the S&P are probably really, really global stocks. And maybe they give me the same level of exposure as the worldwide ETF does. Interestingly, from a geographic exposure, it's almost exactly the same. The S&P 500, 60% of earnings come from the U.S. About 12% from Europe, 8% from Japan, 8% from the U.K. The U.K. will change when they jump off the cliff, but nonetheless, here's the really weird thing. So geographically, the spread was the same. But if you looked at the sectors, S&P 500 is IT is your big sector, and then banks. On the Deutsche Bank world, banks are your big sector, and then it's IT and then pretty much the same. So the only difference is banks or IT. Otherwise, it's more or less the same. So what am I doing? Nothing. Because nothing is my favorite stance. I'm keeping my DBX worldwide. 
The point being is that if you would, the truth is the core shares are a little bit cheaper, 0.3% a year. And if you think that you'd rather have it and rather save the fees, then you can switch. And if it's within an ETF, you can switch nice and easy. I just want to get, you know what will happen with the DBX is one day Europe will be, will start growing again. I don't know when, but it'll happen in my lifetime. And what will happen then is that ETF will autocorrect and upweight Europe from its current 12%. Europe will be 14, 16, 18, and 20. Now, will the S&P do the same, or will those companies do the same? In theory, yes. In practice, I don't know. I'll get back to you in 10 years when Europe has recovered, or whenever they recover, 30 years, 100 years. Europe's having a rough time of it. On the property space, my preference has been PropTrax 10, because it's your local equal weight. And then last year, uh, CoreShares launched the global property which I bought, but I bought outside of my tax-free because I'd already hit my limit for my tax-free for the year. So I bought it in the initial offering in October, and then later this month, Satrix is launching uh, Satrix Property, which is using a Standard & Poor's Index, and the key thing is it's the SAPI, which is the South African Property Index, but it caps the stocks at 10% weighting, which is critical because we've got a couple of stocks that dominate that index, mostly growth point. So what it says is, no, guys, we're going to cap you at 10% max. And I, 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 I intuitively, I like that idea. I'm, I'm comfortable with that idea. I'm not necessarily jumping into any more into the global property because in your data bank worldwide, I have 4.5% property already. So I have global property. That DBX worldwide includes property in... <clears throat> Asia, in Australasia, in North America, Europe, West and, 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 and Eastern Europe, America, South and North, and Africa. So I've got my, property, my global property exposure, in a sense, via the worldwide uh, uh, ETF. But any of those three I like. My preference has been the prop tracks 10. And then the local, so there are a lot of local ones. I don't like the sub-indices. Resi, Indy, Finney. And my reason is quite simple. For many years, the best place to be invested in a sub-index was the Indy. It went in 2011 from 22,000 to 2014, 15, it hit 75,000. Went up 300% in a couple of years. But then you had to switch out and go and buy the resi. And how do you know to do that? I mean, it's just, to me, there's too much active management involved. So I hold the generic index, because what happens? Those industrial stocks will fall out of the index, and the resources will come back in. So for a while there, we had, we had no gold mines in the resi, sorry, in the top 40. And then they all came rushing back in when the, when the gold miners were doing great. And that's the beauty of an index, of a generic index. In a sense, it autocorrects. When some sector's out of favor, those stocks are gone. So African Bank used to be in the top 40. It was trading at 38 Rand. It was in the top 40. It was number 40. And then it started to fall. And by the time it got to 30 bucks, it was out the index. It went to zero, but you didn't take that pain because they kicked it out. Understand the construction of a major index. It is designed to go higher for two reasons. One, inflation. Right? An index, if nothing else, should increase by an inflation amount every year. Because the company should grow, if nothing else, by inflation. With zero skill, a company should be able to increase profits by the prevailing inflation rate. But the other key point with an index is that they take the fallen stars, boot them up, and they pick the new f rising stars and bring them in. So African Bank is losing its way, you're gone. Kumba's losing its way, cheers. PPC is no longer brilliant, you're out of here. And it brings the new high flyers into the equation. By a design of an index, it gets rid of the bad ones and brings in the new winners. And it's not perfect. It kicked out Capitec, for goodness sake, at 500 Rand. Capitec's now 700 Rand. But hey, you know what? Almost everyone's got Capitec wrong, so we won't hold them to that. The problem with the market cap weighted index is that the bigger you are, the bigger your slice. So you have NASPAS almost 20% in your Satrix 40 in your top 40 index. And that's been great for a long time. But is NASPAS always going to be the best stock to own? 
I mean, I'd hate, I mean, you know, never say never, but experience tells me no. At some point, something will happen. And I'm not saying it's going to collapse. If nothing else, one day it just becomes big and mature and boring. You know, 10 cent, like everyone's a client of 10 cent, so there's no more growth there. And, you know, who hasn't got DSTV, so there's no more growth there. And OLX is great, but we're already using, you know, eventually you just become X growth. And then what? So I hate those massively big weightings. I'm always going to prefer an equal weight. The prop tracks 10. 10 biggest stocks in the property space, equal weight. Core shares equal weight 40. The same shares from the top 40, but equal weight. Which means they take the small guys and upweight them, and they take the big guys and downweight them. So when those big guys were running hard, Naspass, Richmond, SAB Miller, MTN once upon a time. When the big stocks, five stocks, were making up 55% of that index, and when they were doing great, the, ind the top 40, Satrix 40, was killing it, and the equal weight was not. But as soon as things start going a little bit sour, and we start seeing NASPASS go sideways for a bit, or Richmond fall, and SAB leave, then suddenly the equal weight starts to win. Two last points in equal weight. Typically, they're a little more expensive in terms of total expense ratio, but the math would tell you that they typically give you an extra 1.5% to 2% per year over the long term. Not every year, but over the long term. So a little more expensive, but offset by better return. So I'm always going for the, the equal weights. So what to put into a portfolio? So we've got three portfolios on the website. You can find it at justonelap.com slash ETF portfolio. So the logic is quite simple. And I always refer this to, I call this my sister's neighbor. So when my sister wants to know what to buy, she phones me. But who does her neighbor phone? She goes into her bank and gets sold a cash deposit and gets completely ripped off. So the question we have said to ourselves is, how do we help my sister's neighbor? So we've put together three model portfolios, and we ask you a very simple question. When do you want the money? If your time horizon is long, we've got a high risk. If your time horizon is, 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 is shortish, we've got a medium risk. And if your time horizon is short, we've got a low risk. That's the high risk one, core shares, prop tracks 10, DBX world. 40, 20, 40. The question, which folks will be saying is, why not some global property in here? Uh, because I've got it in my data bank world, and maybe in time. And when I say maybe in time, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the core shares global property ETF, but I want to watch it. I want to make sure that it is what it says on the sticker. I have no reason to suspect it isn't. But if I'm going to run around and put my head in the block and say it's a great ETF, I need to know it's a great ETF. Those three are great ETFs. I've owned them for years and years and years. I'm trying to think how many. Probably six, seven, eight years. All of them I've been buying pretty much since inception. If you've got a medium risk, we then bring some inflation-linked government bond ETF into it as well. What does that give you? It just gives you a little bit of stability gives you a little bit of yield, although the yield is put back into the price, but it gives you that little bit of stability and that you're now holding bonds which are near cash. And if you want the low risk environment, we bring in NF Tracy, which is basically a money market ETF. A money market ETF is probably the most boring thing in the world, but there's a real value to a money market ETF. What I'm saying in the, in, uh, what I'm saying in the low risk environment the thing with having investments is you never want to be a forced seller. You want to choose when you sell. Now, if I don't need the money for 10, 20 years, I don't have to sell this year. So if the market collapses, no concern. If I'm a, in a low-risk environment, I'm taking the assumption that you're going to need money this year or in the next couple of years. That's why you always keep cash. So that if the market collapses, you actually just sell the cash and you extract that out. So you're not a forced seller of your equity. Typically, a market crash, historically, from crash to back is about two to two and a half years. So that 
I'm figuring a three-year window, you've got your cash pile sitting there. What it'll also do is when a market crashes, what happens? Interest rates go up. So actually, your cash component is going to be doing quite nicely. You will be losing money on your, international, on your equity. Your international equity will go down, but the RAND will weaken. So your DBX goes up. So this is not immune to a market crash. There's one way to be immune to a market crash. Stay out of the market. If you're in the market, what this is going to do is reduce the impact of a market crash. And what we've done, and if you go to the website, uh, justonenup.com slash ETF portfolio. It's a subscription service, but it's no fee for the first year. So sign up and get the docs. And we've got the, the, the fact sheets and everything else. All three of those portfolios beat the market over the five years to September last year. Because when the market is having a tough time, the RAND is having a tough time. In other words, go back to December 2015, Nenegate. Market went off a cliff, but so did the RAND. So what happened? Well, your DBX worlds went up because of the RAND going weaker. Head to the website, get the details. You've got questions, give us a shout. The, the subscription service is, is processes of if we rebalance, if we change ETFs and the like, we'll drop your mail, we'll let you know. Most importantly, when the world is ending, like Brexit and Trump, we'll send you an email and remind you, don't panic. I know it's easy to say. Especially seen as both times I'm sitting in a hotel room looking at the ocean saying to people, hey, don't panic. The sea is beautiful. Oh, you probably can't see the sea. Take that part out. Just don't panic. <laughs> it's an important point. Eh? If I had told you a year ago in February that Brexit was going to happen and that Trump was going to trump Hillary Clinton, you would have said, oosh, markets are going to die. Yeah, yeah, End of the world. Not yet. The world will end, but it's going to take a lot more than some voters in the UK or the US to end it. It might actually just take Donald Trump, but nonetheless. Transfers. So every year I stand up here, and every year I say, you will be able to transfer your, your tax-free account from one provider to another provider next year. And it turns out that every year I have lied to you. Not my intention, I promise. So first, when these things were launched, we were told transfers would be able to take effect in March 2016. And March 2016 arrived, and we were told that transfers would be able to be affected in November 2016. And November 2016 arrived, and no one said a word, and now we are in February 2017, and you still can't transfer your tax-free account from one provider to another provider. I know what the problem is that they're having. I'm not going to delve into it. So what, here's the problem. So you've got some tax-free account with provider A. You turn it into cash, and you move the money to provider B. How does that provider know that this is not going to subtract from your 500000 You know what? You run an Excel spreadsheet. This cannot be so hard. Apparently, it is. So we do not yet have the ability to transfer your tax-free account from one place to another, which is a bit of a crisis if you, by mistake, took one that is a cash account. At some point, transfers may happen. Minister Gordon does his budget speech in two weeks, and maybe he will announce something in that budget speech. I've heard nothing, and my contact at the Treasury is no longer answering my emails when I ask about transfers, which probably tells me everything. What you can do is you can open another one. You're currently with provider A, and you decided that provider A is not so lacquer, and you don't want to be with provider A anymore. Well, leave it. Go open one with provider B and start funding that one. And when transfers are applicable, which will hopefully happen before I turn 131, you can move from A to B. So just open a new one and start funding the new one. Remember. Just because you're cunning and you've got two tax-free accounts does not mean you now have 60000 a year. You still only have 30000 a year across as many providers as you have. So if you don't like your current provider, you're stuck with them for now, but you can go and open with the second provider. Budget speech on the 22nd of February. Minister Gordon will be standing up and telling us a whole bunch of things. Mostly he'll be telling us how we pay more tax because that's what finance ministers do. He will talk around tax-free accounts. 
He will probably tell us how many people have opened them. He will probably tell us how much money has been invested. And that's probably all he will say. I do not expect him to announce changes to the limits. As I said, he is going to have to deliver a very tough budget. Basically a budget that is going to make South Africans poorer as a result. He is not at that point going to basically then give you free money for your tax-free account. It's just going to look weird. So I think he's going to leave the 30000 per year, and I think he will leave the 500000 lifetime. The lifetime limit is not an issue until we start approaching that 500000 which is many years down the line. The 30000 is the one that, is that, that I and many others would like to increase. But let's be quite frank on that. 30,000 is 2,500 rand a year. In South Africa, half of our population earns less than 3,500. 2,500 a month. Sorry. 2,500 a month when the majority of our population don't even earn 3,500. This, frankly, is not our government's biggest concern. This isn't even in their top 100 concerns. So it will go up. Not this year. And I don't think it's going to happen until we have an economy that looks strong again. And that might take a little bit longer. Can you change what you bought? Yes, you can. So you went and bought an ETF. You've decided you don't like that ETF anymore. You can sell it. You can go and buy another ETF. There is no impact. There is no impacts on your limit. There is no tax to be paid. You can chop and change. You can trade in this account. You can do 500 transactions in a day. Okay, your finger would hurt. But you can trade it. So it's one of the things. When I come 1st of March, I drop another 30,000. And I've now got 95,000. I can start taking my lazy system and trading it in my tax-free account. I know some folks are doing it already. So you can trade in this account. You can transact as often as you want. In a normal life, if you were transacting repeatedly, SARS would hit you with forget capital gains. They would hit you with income tax. This is tax-free. You can transact as often as you want. No questions asked. Is it worth starting at 75? Sure. For two reasons. You might live to be 125. But more than that is if you've got the money and you don't need it, why not get the tax-free benefit? Even if you're just doing it as a cash account or as a very low-risk bond account, that's fine. There's a benefit. Yeah, as I said, when finance ministers stand up, what do they do? They take money. We call it tax. In this case, they're giving you some back. If you have the spare cash, I don't think age is the issue, use it. Why not? For your kids, as I said, you absolutely can. The guardian needs to do FICA. If the child is under seven, you need to go to a financial service provider rather than a stockbroker. To you, as an individual, there is no difference. Your stockbroker might actually be an FSP, not a stockbroker. You know, we think if you enable me to buy shares on the JSC, you must be a stockbroker. No, 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 no. There are a hundred odd stockbrokers. There are thousands of financial service providers. But a financial service provider can enable you to transact on the JSC. Do I have a preferred? Yes, that is mine there. So that is my portfolio as of 1st of March. The first two years, I bought the uh, Equal Weight 40 and the DBX World. In March, when I drop my extra cash in for the new tax year, I will re-rate the portfolio to 40, 20, 40 across those three. So I will be holding at the close of business on the 1st of March those three, t those three ETFs in those three weightings, 40, 20, 40. Just one lap.com slash ETF portfolio. Assuming you have money left over every month, then you should have a tax-free account. And if you don't have money left over every month, then, then, then jiggle your budget and see if you can't find some to open a tax-free account. The point with it is, and I was having a chat with a, with a young gentleman a, late last year, I think at our last power hour, and he was like, ah, oh, but all he can do is 200 rand a month. You know, that's 2,400 a year. And he said, is it worth it? I said, yeah. You know, it's, uh, would he like to be able to do 2,500 rand a month? Sure. He doesn't have it. He has 240, whatever, 200, 2,400 for the year. It's money you're saving for your future. It's always worth it. I've never met someone who said, I regret saving. 
as long as you manage to do the, I mean, the, the challenge, and I'm not yet old enough to worry about it, the challenge, because I have no kids, is to spend the last cent on the last day. Because I don't want to paste. I don't want to have this problem of having an estate. My estate will be an empty bottle of red wine that I've just finished. <laughs> I don't know how I'm going to do it, but that's the cunning plan. Ignore the short term. Don't worry that the fact that you've maybe done nothing in your tax-free account, that, that money in the bank has beaten you. This is short term. Worry about your 5, 10, 30-year returns. This is a long-term investment product. I know long term is difficult. I know we are in a hurry to be rich. We have plans for Friday and we would like some money for those plans. But this is not how it's going to happen. This is not going to make you rich any Friday this decade. Keep it simple. Complexity never works. And watch those costs. Costs are, costs are the biggest killer out there. You want your transaction fee as low as possible. You want your admin fee at zero. Those are my favorite costs. Um, and my advice is, you know, in terms of what do you, you know, should I, to me, your first 30000 a year goes into your tax-free account. Then you can go and buy individual shares or other ETFs or whatever the case may be. But your first direct investment that you are doing, and this is obviously separate from your pensions and all those sort of things that you've got at your place of work. But your first 30000 a year that you are managing put into your tax-free account. Don't go and buy that little penny stock that might triple in price because we all know what happens to little penny stocks that might triple in price. They fall off the edge of the cliff and they spend the rest of their life taunting you. The worst thing about African Bank was not that it now trades at 40 cents. The worst thing is that for two and a half years, every time you logged into your account, there was African Bank taunting you. Zero value, nothing you could do about it. Disclaimers, so we keep the lawyers happy by not keeping them busy. Uh, contact details, questions. I think I should have a few minutes. Uh, great question. If a account holder dies, does it have to be converted to cash and transferred to the estate? It does not necessarily have to be transferred into cash. You can, in your estate, say, I want the, the contents of my tax-free account, as they are, transferred to X. Correct Amanda. They will not transfer as tax-free. The tax-free component falls away but you can transfer the, 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 the holdings with them. Because they treat it, you know, if I, I hold Willie's shares, and when I die, I'm going to leave the Willie's shares to, I don't know, my niece or something like that. She, we're not going to sell them and give her the cash. We're going to give her the Willie's shares. You can put 27.5% or 350,000 into retirement annuity every year. Your question is, which should you do first? So that's cunning. So the answer there for those who are on the, the webcast. Max out the 27 and a half, take the tax you save, stick it into your tax free account, which is great if you can hit the 27 and a half. If you can't, you know, I just by, 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 by gut instinct hate retirement annuities. But then I was one of those people who bought a retirement annuity in the early 90s and got ripped off by more directions than are possibly to imagine. 2017 is different. Uh, if you are crafty about your retirement annuity, you won't get ripped off as much um, and then there are certainly benefits to it so the con what a lot of folks are saying although a lot of them sell retirement annuities is max your 27 and a half and then ha huh, great question what happens if the etf gets delisted so if an etf is delisted it'll get paid out uh, at net asset value cash right and then net asset value is the value of the index so let's say satrix 40 is delisted today the index is 46,000, so the etf is 46 rand you will get 46 rand per etf in your tax-free account and you then go and buy another etf so whilst you're you know might not be happy because you might have liked the ETF, is you will get cash for it at its fair value because ETFs always trade at fair value and it will, the money will come directly into your tax-free account and will not have any impact on your li limits or deposits or anything. So basically you'll have a pile of cash which you then go and buy another ETF with. So in terms of liquidity with an ETF, there's always liquidity in an ETF because there's a market maker. So the market maker, that, that ETF I mentioned, 46 Rand is the value. The market maker is a buyer at 45 Rand and 90 cents and a seller at 46 Rand and 10 cents. That little margin either side is their profit. And basically what they're doing is as the index changes, they change. So there's always liquidity potential in the market there. Ladies and gents, I'm going to park it there because uh, I've run my time. Uh, video will be up tomorrow. Uh, we've got two more power hours in, in March. Now they are in Joburg, but they will be on the website, and you can get them at just one lap. You can attend the webcast. 
On the 9th of March, I'm in Durban helping you find a perfect share. And on the 16th of March, Anthony Clark in Cape Town has topped small caps for 2017. Obviously, you can't attend because you're in Joburg, unless you happen to be a traveler. Uh, but you can get it online, webcast, or video the next day. Uh, apologies for running over. Thank you very much for your time this evening. Thanks very much, ladies and gents. Thank you.